<laughs> so, okay, so let's pick, up, pick it up from here. So we have this equation of motion, and we are still asking the same question that we asked at the beginning. What is the position as a function of time? So, well, what we have to do is we have to solve this differential equation for the x as a function of time. How many here have done that before? Solve a differential equation. Yeah, you, uh, how, have you solved a second order differential equation before? Really? Wait, what math class have you taken? Are you saying uh, second derivative? Yeah. yeah. So you have taken up through math 3? No. Math 3b? Um, second, derivative, second derivative we learned in calculus 1. Yeah, so you learned the second derivative. So this is the question. Um, so when we say solve this differential equation, this is the question that we are asking. So we have this equation. Let me just copy it over here. And you know, the question I'm asking, it's not, the, uh, it's not the same question as, have you taken second derivative of a function? Here the difficulty is that you have an equation for in terms of this unknown function. This x as a function of time, it's an unknown function. You don't know what it is. You don't know if it's a, you know, is it x squared? Is it x to the third power? What is it? You don't really know. So, so when we say solve this differential equation, this is what we mean. We mean you need to find out what this x of t is. You know, write it out as some kind of function of time t, so that once, um, once when you have found this function, then you should now be able to put it, plug it in take two derivatives and see that this function satisfies this equation. That's what it means for you to solve a differential equation. You are saying that you have done that in your, yeah, not in, in math 3a you don't ever do it. In math 3b you might do it depending on the instructor, so there's a strong glare there. So, um, so you know, I think the prerequisite for this class is only math 3a. So I'm not actually expecting people to have done this, but you know, I'm just asking. Uh, how many people, so uh, has anyone here solved a, a first order differential equation? As in differential equation involving only a single derivative? No one's done that either? How many people are taking math 3b right now? So people who are not raising your hand, you have taken math 3b already. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, let me actually ask you this, this question. Because uh, I think when I say solve differential equation, it sounds very abstract. Because there are very simple forms of differential equation. You actually know how to solve. Um, let me ask you this. Um, let's, see. this was, let's say this was your differential equation. Um, dx dt is equal to um, t squared. Do you know, this is technically a differential equation. It's an equation involving a derivative in terms of a bunch of stuff. Any, um, do people here know how to solve this? Find x of t that satisfies this differential equation? How would you do it? Three, not three t to the third, one third times t to the third, right? How did you get that, Jared? Yeah, you took the integral, right? This is, uh, this is actually covered in math 3a. Uh, you use the fundamental theorem of calculus, you recognize, oh, it says derivative of this function I want to find is this. So all right, I guess I can just do this. Um, take the integral with respect to t, um, and when you do that, then you do get um, so left hand side from fundamental theorem of calculus will be simply x of t plus maybe an integration constant. And the right hand side, well I know how to do that derivative, I mean integral. Uh, right hand side becomes one third t to the third power. Right? So you would get, oh, x of t, that's uh, one third t to the third power plus or minus, minus integration constant. Right? Everyone here knows how to do this, right? 
Yeah, so I mean, it wasn't presented to you this way when you're taking math 3a. But um, this is a form of a very simple differential equation. And it's a very limited kind of differential equation. But, you know, th so that's what I want you to imagine when I say you are solving a differential equation. And once you have solved it, how would you verify that you solved it correctly? You take the derivative. Um, so that's uh, what you do when you are integrating something and you want to verify that you remember your integral formulas correctly. Here, um, what taking the derivative means, you take this function and plug it back into here. That's what taking derivative does here. And then you verify, you get, oh, I get t squared back. Yeah. So uh, you have then done a very elementary version of solving a differential equation. Um, so when you look at this, um, it gets a little bit more complicated. It's like uh, when you have um, implicit differentiation, then it becomes harder and harder to solve. Um, so you know, I, can, I think uh, for this class, it's a little bit harder to go beyond this because I'm not allowed to assume you have taken Math 3B, where I think we are supposed to learn about um, um, separation of variables, right? How many here remember the phrase separation of variables? From, yeah, if you're taking 3B right now, you might have seen it by now. So, um, but you know, I'm not allowed to assume that. So, um, so let me tell you a little bit of a secret. Um, we are not actually going to solve it. I know I've been saying we are, actually, we are going to solve it, but I'm not going to. And if you know anything about physicists, we don't actually like doing differential, we don't like solving differential equations you will learn way more about directly solving differential equations in your Math 3E than you will ever learn in any upper division physics classes. What we physicists like to do is when you have a differential equation, instead of having a systematic method for solving it, as in, you know, by systematic, you um, think of like an algebra step. Um, you have, I don't know, one half x squared is equal to, uh, 3x plus 2. And like if you are given this as an equation, then you can imagine solving for it, right? You put it into standard form, you use a quadratic formula, you solve it, right? That's how mathematicians do it. The way us physicists like to do, at least in the context of this differential equation, is that um, instead of actually solving it, we are just going to guess an answer. So here, instead of actually you know, going through the algebra, it's a, so to do the analogy, it's like me saying, all right, I'm gonna stare it for a while, I guess, hmm, is my x equal to two? And I plug it in and see, you know, two squared, four divided by two, so that's equal to two. Two times three plus two, um, oops, six, that's eight. Okay, so two is not the answer. So I have to guess something different. Is my x equal to, I don't know, four. Four squared, 16, divided by two, that's eight. Four times three, 12, 14. All right, that's not quite it. Okay, this could take a while. Let me just do one more guess, and uh, I'll maybe stop doing that. Let's guess six. Six squared, divided by two is, um, so 36 divided by two is 18. Six times three is, oh, 18, plus two, all right, um, 20. You see that I'm getting closer, right? Um, so that's actually one way of solving this equation. And I don't have any systematic method of um, doing it, so let me actually make this simpler. Let's say I didn't have that plus two. Then this x equals six, that is the correct answer, right? And you could have gotten to this answer by properly doing the algebra, by canceling this x, moving two over, or x is equal to six. Now let me ask you this philosophical question. Does it make a difference? as to the correctness of your answer, if you arrived at this answer by guessing it, or if you arrived at that answer by going through proper algebraic steps. Still the correct answer. So what's actually more important is that you know that this is correct. And you know, when I guess this, I don't simply assume it's correct. I do double check, I do plug it in. So with this difficult differential equation, that's what we are going to do. We are not going to go through any systematic set of steps to solve it. We're just gonna guess an answer. And once we have guessed it, we are gonna check it to see if it's actually correct. And if it's not, we will modify it. And then um, 
<laughs> and so that's how we are going to quote unquote solve this differential equation. Because this is actually about two or three semesters of calculus ahead of what you already know. So if we uh, try to solve it directly, there's no way we can do it in this class. But if you are guessing and checking, then we can do more than what we can do from what we properly know. So uh, we are going to guess and check. And when you are guessing and checking, it helps to have some intuition. It helps, I mean, so we are going to maybe get at this uh, eventually. But we want to have uh, some more better justification for eventually getting at this. So um, I stare at this for a while. And I can describe um, some of the features that my solution must have. So, so uh, let me just point out those features, because it takes a little bit of practice to spot them. So when I look at this equation, here are some features of x of t that I can point out. Here's some weird thing about x of t. I take two derivatives. So I don't know what happens if I took one derivative. I, I don't have that information. But I do know when I take two derivatives, I actually get the same x back. Right? So if I take x and if I took two time derivatives, I get something that's proportional to x itself. Does that sound like something that any old function does? Like if you had a polynomial, would you expect to see this happen? No, right? With a polynomial, each time you take a derivative, you reduce its order. So you are never going to come back to the same function. So all right. So that already tells you that this is a, some kind of a special function. It's not a polynomial. It's a special function that has this feature, that when you take two derivatives, that it comes back to the same function. What functions do you know that does that? So you have, you have seen exponential, that's one. Um, exponential is where if you take the derivative, you get the same function back. So if you take two derivatives, um, so then you can get the same function back. So let me actually point out one more feature that will say, hmm, exponential doesn't quite work. Because when I take two derivatives, it's not just that it's proportional to x. It's actually proportional to minus x of t. I have this minus sign here. And you know, k is positive, m is positive. So you get something back that's an original function times a minus thing. Would you ever get that with a function of this form? So you know, if we are guessing, OK, based on this, it might be an exponential. Then you are guessing, is my x of t something that looks like this? a times exponential of, I don't know, let's say some coefficient b times t. If I took two derivatives of this, could I ever get a negative of uh, original function? No, right? Because if I take two derivatives, this is what double derivative looks like. Um, each time, I get the, this term brought down from chain, um, chain rule. So I get a times, or so let me write on this way, b squared times a exponential of bt. So this is my x of this is my x of t. So I get the same function back, which is good. But for this coefficient in front, I have b squared. Um, that does not work for me, because there is no choice of b um, that will give me a negative sign that I need. So I need a something that's a special function, like an exponential, but not quite exponential. What other functions do you know where, as you take 2, 4, 6, some or even number of derivatives, you get the same function back. Sign, that's one, right? OK, so let me guess a sign. Um, so let me say, all right, let's say, given all these features, let's say I, I guess. Uh, so let me erase this. They didn't work out. So I'm going to guess x of t is equal to, let me put in all those other fixes that we did before a times sine of b times t. This b and a are there so that the units come out right. right? So let me call this guess 1. And what I'm going to do is plug this in into this differential equation and see what I get. So plug it in here, left-hand side. 
I get um, two derivatives sine of bt. Each derivative will give me a factor of b out from chain rule. Sine turns into minus, co sorry, so sine turns into cosine in the first derivative. Second derivative turns into minus sine. So um, this is what I get on the left hand side b squared times minus a sine of bt. This is coming from this left hand side. Good? All right. Well, let's keep going. So if um, keep plugging in here. So we want this to equal, this left hand side to equal this right hand side. Minus k over m times x. Let me plug it in again. So a times sine of bt. And I try to look for what things I can cancel out. So um, well, I'm going to choose a value of t that's not 0. And sine of bt cancels out. Um, a cancels out. A is hopefully not 0. Um, so that's all that cancels out. So I get minus b squared is equal to minus k over m. Oh, minus signs cancel out. So yeah, it turns out this is a solution, provided that a particular weird condition is met. The weird condition is this algebraic relationship. This is not something we started out with. Um, this uh, sort of happened <laughs> as I was uh, plugging in these numbers. So. Um, so all right, so this is uh, correct. So correct if b is equal to square root of k over m. So I just want you to pay attention to this. That we started out by including this b because we wanted the units to come out right. Turns out it's not just OK that this b has the correct unit. It actually has to have a very specific uh, value if uh, this is going to be a solution. That's a little bit weird. All right. Um, so that was our first guess. Um, but uh, when I when we go back to our you know intuition exercise, this guess does it look like our um, thing that we are looking at before we started doing this mathematically? Not exactly, right? Our this guess was sine, but that's cosine. Um, is this uh, also a solution to this? Well, you won't know until you try it, right? Here's one. Yeah, here's one thing about guess and check method. One thing that it cannot tell you is that if you guess the correct answer, it's a unique answer. So um, if you guess the correct answer, there may, may be multiple other correct answers. So, so you know, we have this, which from our earlier intuition exercise should be a solution to this. So let's try it. Let's see if it works out. So this is going to be our second guess. Let's call this our guess two. So this is our guess two. And I'm just going to plug, plug this in. Oh, I guess I can actually use a subscript. So this was our x1. This is our x2. Well, imagine plugging in into this uh, differential equation. I take two derivatives. So once again, each derivative brings out a factor of b from the chain rule. Uh, derivative of cosine is minus a sine. Derivative of, the, uh, derivative of minus sine is co minus cosine. All right, so let me write that down. Uh, the left-hand side is uh, b squared times minus a cosine of bt. Um, so right, that's equal. We are trying to see if that's equal to right hand side. Well, um, so that's equal to minus. I mean, the question is, is that equal to equal to minus k over m times uh, x? So this thing again, a cosine of bt. We look at what else cancels out again. Uh, cosine of bt cancels out. A cancels out. Minus sine cancels out. So we get the same um, relationship we had before, that 
b squared is equal to k over m. Mm. So I guess whatever that b is, I don't have to change it. It's still the same uh, constraint that we are using. But so, so yeah, apparently this is also a solution. Both x1 and x2 are solutions. So which is the real solution? They are both solutions. Um, so um, the most general form of solution for this differential equation, it actually takes this form. Let me write it down with a completely new notation. This is the most general solution that you will see. If you ever see this differential equation again in your math class, this is the most general solution. Uh, you can actually write it in two different ways. Uh, let, me, mm, let me write down the version I prefer first, and then I'll write down the one that you will more likely see in your math class. So the version I prefer is actually this one. x of t is equal to, so you still have this a. It stands, up, it stands for something times, uh, I'm going to use cosine. I actually like cosine better than sine. So I'm going to use cosine. And let me give the standard symbol to this uh, quantity b here. Um, the standard symbol for that is actually omega. Where have you seen omega before? Yeah, angular velocity for rotational motion, right? Uh, do you guys remember when I called this angular frequency? Yeah, well, we'll get to that later. So this is what we are going to call angular frequency. And we'll go over the terminologies at some point or later. Um, so with the circular motion, with the circular motion, you actually have a choice. When you have something that's moving in a circle, you could try to describe its angular velocity, or you could call its motion angular frequency. As in, you know, you can imagine what frequency of this motion is, right? You can see if it takes one second to do one full turn, then its frequency is, you know, one over one cycles per second. So its angular frequency would be where you turn cycles into radians. So if this has frequency of one cycle per second, it would have angular frequency of two pi radians per second. So with this motion, you could have described in terms of angular velocity, which you have seen, or in terms of angular frequency. Here, um, it really only angular frequency makes sense because, you know, I mean, look at this. Is anything rotating here? Not in physical sense. Um, so yeah, yeah, so I'm going to uh, always be consistent and call this only angular frequency, not angular velocity, unless this time around. So cosine of omega times t, you might think, oh, that's just our second guess. So this is what I'm going to change. Instead of ending here, I'm going to say, well, I can actually add a constant angle, phi, here, without changing anything. So I'm going to do that. And if you check if this is a solution to this differential equation, you'll find that, yes, it is. Um, so this is the form I prefer, and that's the one that's in your uh, worksheet. But let me write down the one that you are eventually going to see in your math class so that um, you can kind of figure, you know, <laughs> um, I'm not giving you something that's completely foreign from what other people are doing. So this x of t, I can describe it this way. It's a sum of my second guess and the first guess. So uh, a times Mm, do I want to call it A? Well, let me not call it A. Uh, I'm going to use two new constants, B and C. Uh, X of t is equal to B times cosine of omega t plus C times sine of omega t. And I uh, encourage you to check it for yourself. Plug this into this differential equation and see if it's a solution. And if you go through the calculation, you will see that, yes, this is also a solution. And this is the most general um, solution to this differential equation. And uh, what else do I want to say about it? Uh, one last thing is, um, so if you're good enough with the trigonometry, you can actually prove that these two are essentially the same um, form. 
Uh, it, the easiest thing you can, the easier thing to do is take this form and re-express it into this form. Do people know how to do that? Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, uh, I will demonstrate that later. There's a trig identity that's useful for you to use it here. Um, do people remember angle addition formula? Yeah, I mean, if you remember it, great. Then it's an exercise left to you to show that using angle addition formula, you can re-express this into this form. Do that on your own if you want to. Um, but uh, I will save that for when we do something called wave interference later, because I'm kind of out of time. So, but this is the, this or this, uh, is the most general form of solution to this. And uh, let me just give you one other thing that you will eventually see in your math class. It's uh, this idea that, um, so when you look at this, uh, you have two um, parameters that are still undetermined. Um, that's an omega is determined. So based on looking at this, uh, we have to say omega is equal to square root of k over m. I have no choice. Uh, unless this is true, this is not a solution. Right? So omega is completely determined. The two parameters that are undetermined is this parameter b. Like it can be anything now. It can even be zero. If I let b equal to zero, then I get this back. Right? And c is another parameter that's undetermined. It can be anything right now. If it's equal to zero, then I get this back. So this general solution has two undetermined quantities. And that's not an accident. Um, that two sort of corresponds to this two here. That this is a second order differential equation. So it has two independent solutions. One and two independent solutions. And what I'm presenting to you as the general solution is simply a sum of those two independent solutions. So the, you know, I mean, I just want to point that out as a little nice factoid to know. <laughs> Not going to do anything more with it other than to point out that this is general solution and that all of that is related. Okay. So, um, so yeah. Um, so this is the general solution, and as I said, uh, you can verify that it's correct. And uh, once once again, as I um, confessed when we were starting this. That's a, this is a more than half of what we do when physicists solve a differential equation. We have this a list of convenient guesses that we can try, and many of them turn out to be the correct solution to the differential equation we happen to be looking at. 